Hello and welcome to Integrid TV in association with Enjurati. I'm joined now by Chandu Visveshwarya, who is uh, the founding president and CEO of Utopus Insights. Uh, Chandu, first of all, welcome. Thank you for making the time to be here. And uh, I'd like to get straight into it because we were talking about a little bit of air and there's, there's quite a lot of hugely interesting things that I'd like you to share with our, uh, with our viewers. Um, but uh, first of all, in, in order to construct the narrative, um, you know, you were talking off air that uh, everything that we're doing is actually fundamentally about economics. Uh, may, we may want to drive an electric vehicle, but we will do so when it makes economic sense to do so. Can you just, you, you just bring that narrative to life for us a little bit? Of course. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Adam, for having me on your interview. So, you know, energy is a commodity. There aren't green electrons and black electrons. They're all just electrons. And so at the end of the day, um, what will create mass change or mass adoption of new technology is always just economics. So we will drive electric vehicles because they are three times more efficient than having explosions in a steel chamber to get locomotion. We will use heat pumps because they are four times more efficient than having, let's say, oil furnaces to heat a building. Industrial processes will electrify because they are more efficient. So at the end of the day, uh, it's economics that will drive change. If you look at the cheapest form of energy anywhere in the world, Almost everywhere, it's either solar energy or wind energy that is the cheapest form of energy. And that is what will drive the mass adoption of these renewable forms of energy. It's not that we're not caring about the future of the planet, although we are. It's not because CO2 is reaching 430 parts per million, although it is. It's not because we're not afraid of uh, rising seas, although we are. But what will make a difference, what will cause mass adoption is indeed economics. And those economics mm -hmm. are also constantly changing, which is something that's fundamentally different from a little bit the, uh, you know, the fossil fuel era, where uh, you know, the amount of energy you got out of a liter of oil was a finite thing. But with all the R&D going into energy storage, PVs, and, uh, and uh, wind turbines, the efficiency of those systems is, uh, I mean, we were talking off air about Moore's law, but there's something similar going on in this industry as well, isn't there? Absolutely. So wind has been on a cost curve for more than 20 years coming down. Solar energy has been on a cost curve. Storage has been on a cost curve. Uh, we will soon be mass manufacturing wind turbines that are floating. And so suddenly, two-thirds of the Earth's surface area becomes amenable to having wind turbines. So this is not business as usual. These are fundamental transformative changes that are coming, whether we like it or not. And so efficiency is a good thing. Clean energy is a good thing. The only ding against all of this progress is that this energy source is intermittent. And so when the sun shines, when the wind is blowing, you have abundant energy, maybe even too much. And then at night or when the wind is not blowing, you don't have enough energy. And how do you deal with all of that? That is the third leg of the stool. And if we solve that problem, we're going to make progress by leaps and bounds. And you, you, you're talking about you know, that's the key issue about how to dispatch the energy in the right way that it becomes something useful. Uh, and also at this conference, there's a, there, there are a lot of conversations where people are talking about, uh, you know, the integration between the, uh, the TSO and the DSO, but, and th these are my words, but it still feels a very much a, 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 a project and uh, engineering way of looking at it rather mm -hmm. than a data layer and holistic way of looking at the entire system and how, how do you pull that together? Because it's a, it's a key thing, isn't it? Because yes, we want to create the cheapest form of energy, but it also needs to be used when it's useful, not when it's created. 
So, so how, based on the work you've done, do you see that whole system coming together? So I will tell you, Adam, data is the new gold in all of this. So if we're going to get our energy from the wind and from the sun, the fuel cost just went away. We need to be able to harness that data, and the key to all of that lies, uh, we need to harness that energy, and the key lies in data and using it properly. So um, my company, Utopus Insights, was born as a spin-out from IBM Research with a long heritage of data science and big data analytics. And we've been studying energy systems for a number of years from the point of view of turning data into actionable insight. So I believe that if you take all of the data that's available, both within a utility and what we call exogenous data like satellite or weather data, this can be converted into the insight necessary to practically make renewable energy dispatchable, to use your words, or in other words, much more predictable. And I believe that the key to all of this lies in a couple of very important advances. One has to do with curating all of the data that's available. The second has to do with using the most advanced data science and machine learning techniques to be able to forecast. Once you get that peak into the future, the key is to understand that there is uncertainty in these forecasts and to take that into account to take the appropriate actions to harness all of this energy. So in brief, the key to all of this is in the data, but in making use of that data in the best possible way. And this is not a, 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 a that uncertainty piece. If, if we can just stay there a, a little bit, I mean, you, you, you said it really well when we were off air. So, you know, human beings don't like uncertainty, but uh, you know, based on your work at IBM and in, in chip design, is that that uncertainty? We shouldn't be afraid of it. We just need to incorporate it into a system and learn how to manage it. Is, is, is I, did I understand that correctly when you're looking at it that way? Adam, we shouldn't just not be afraid of uncertainty. I believe we should embrace uncertainty. Uncertainty is a fact of life. So we try to predict and we try to forecast, but you can't do that perfectly. So we should understand that there are error bands in our forecasting, and then we should use a stochastic analysis to make optimal decisions. The human approach to uncertainty is to worst case every possible source of uncertainty so that we can sleep at night knowing that the lights will still be on. And that is the wrong approach. That is a wasteful approach. And this has been shown in many other domains other than energy. Therefore, I believe that the key is to allow a machine to do what it does well, to model the uncertainty and use stochastics and forecasting to make optimal decisions for us going forward. And so everything that you've described is not some theoretical lab-based exercise, and uh, you know you're, 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 uh, you've you've spun out this company and you're going off on a wing and a prayer. You, 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 it's actually real. You, you, you've done this work in Vermont, and uh, again, I'm not I'm not going to tell the story. Please tell us the story because there's nothing better that. Uh, that um, th from my experience that this utility business likes than a proven use case, you know. So uh, please share us what you've done with Velco. Oh, I'll be glad to do that, Adam. So about four years ago, uh, Vermont Electric Power Company, or Velco, uh, approached us with a problem. They had a number of wind farms in the northern part of the state, and the population centers are more to the south. And they had a classical problem of bringing the energy from where it was produced to where it was needed, and they were running into congestion problems. The congestion was causing the wind energy to be curtailed, leaving some farmers very upset who had invested in these wind farms. And they called us to see what we could do to help them. We embarked on a journey with Velco. Velco is the high voltage transmission company for all of Vermont. And interestingly, it is owned by the 18 distribution utilities all over the state. 
So we worked with that entire system to set up something called the Vermont Energy Analytics Center. The way we went about this challenge is to first focus on weather forecasting. Clearly, with the integration of renewable energy, we are ever more weather dependent. So we set up a hyperlocal, high resolution, specialized weather forecasting across the entire state of Vermont. We were practically trying to track every cloud and every gust of wind, looking out with a lead time of about 72 hours. And give that some context. Uh, what sort of lead time were they working on before that? So, um, or, the, or did they not have any? So almost every utility subscribes to some weather forecasting service. The trouble with that, Adam, is that the weather forecasting today is on a very coarse scale. The models are set up at either a continental level or a half continental level. And then you get statements out of it like 30% chance of rain in the tri-state area. And nobody knows what that means. It's not even actionable. What I want to know is what will be the wind at a 90 meter hub height and what will be the three dimensional direction of that wind. It's that kind of specificity that we need. So once we set up this weather forecasting with great success, I might add, we then took advantage of that weather forecasting to perform energy forecasting for every wind farm and solar farm across the state of Vermont. And we achieved unprecedented accuracy in that forecasting with a mean average error of about 6% for solar and about 9% for wind. Single digit accuracy is unheard of. We also took advantage of the weather forecast to create energy demand forecasts, which is not a new problem, but it has a new twist, which is that you have a lot of solar behind the meter. And therefore, a sunny day is very different from a cloudy day in terms of the net demand. We then took the forecast of the energy production and the energy demand, combined it with grid models, and used the aforementioned stochastic engine to help them make decisions. Decisions such as how to mitigate congestion, how to optimize storage, how to predict the probability of peaks, how to avoid certain charges that the independent system operator applies if you are part of a peak, and so on and so forth. Now, the four years of work that we've done with Velco made them see the power of all of this data and forecasting and data science, so much so that they encouraged us to spin out from IBM Research, and they are our investor as a startup at Utopus Insights. And uh, I'm, I'm getting all sorts of signals that I'm coming to the end of the time, but I want to ask you, uh, uh, ask you one, more, uh, one more question. Is, uh, and uh, I would imagine that every sort of utility listening to this going, actually, that sounds great. That's, wh that's what we need. How, and, and when you first do a job, it takes a little bit longer, but how replicable is it? I mean, how, in theory anyway, could you uh, uh, quickly could a a, a, a ecosystem, uh, you know, based in uh, over here in Europe, get up and running to that degree of resolution that you've just described? Yeah, that's a great question, Adam. So you're right that the first time we attempted to do this. Uh, it took us a good six months to get all the weather data ingested, crunched, and for us to produce accurate forecasts. We can now do that in a week. Right. Uh, in fact, we can set up a weather forecasting system in seconds. We can then use historical weather data and energy production data to train all of our self-learning algorithms uh, to start producing energy forecasts within a week. And Here's the best part about self-learning systems. Every wind farm and solar farm in the world has its own idiosyncrasies. Self-learning just means that on a daily basis, the algorithm gets better all by itself. And once some number of months have passed, you've seen every possible situation. And now it's simply a question of the algorithm finding the right patterns and making the predictions for you. So in short, we believe that the future will be very much
cloud-oriented to do all of this calculation. Some of these calculations are computationally intensive, but computation is cheap. Um, and we have invested in what we call extreme automation to be able to automatically bring in data, curate it, organize it, put it into a common data model, apply our algorithms, and start up a portal for the client very, very quickly in a matter of days. That's amazing. And on that note, we have to leave it. Uh, thank you very much for watching. This is uh, another interview at InnoGrid TV in association with Enterati. Thanks again.